Hi, and welcome to season two of the Secret Library podcast. It's really, really wonderful to be back with you after a six month break with a couple of interruptions with a couple of special episodes. But here we are with a whole new season of shows. And we are deciding, well, I have decided, to be fair, to focus on a different theme that relates to the writing life for each season going forward. So this season, I decided that the theme that was most important, that felt the most relevant to me and to people I was talking to was that of revision. We've talked a lot in the show about routine, about getting to the page, about staying connected to the writing process. We've talked about ideas. We've talked about what happens once you publish a book, the routine, all of this. But we haven't talked as much in depth about what happens when you finish a first draft between the end of that first draft and when it's ready to go, when it's ready to be sent to your editor, your agent, when you're ready to hit publish, when you're ready to send it into a publisher. So that's what we're focusing on this season. What what different writers do, how they approach revision, what their mindset is, what their tools are, what the steps are that they take, how they actually do it. So you've got a first draft, but you're not sure what to do next. This is the season for you. This is episode one of season two of the Secret Library podcast. My guest this week is the amazing Jade Chang. She is the author of The Wangs vs. the World, and you will remember that she has been on the show before, but I love talking to her and I loved her book so much that I really wanted to bring her back to talk about revision. Also because her story, The Wangs vs. the World, is fairly complicated. There's a lot of different points of view going on, and I was interested as we see more and more books with multiple points of view, multiple plot lines, How do people revise them? How do they write them? How do they put them together? So it was important to me to have Jade back, and I'm really excited to start the season with her. So I hope you really enjoy listening to Jade Chang. Hey, Jade, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me again. So... I'm, we were, we were talking just before we started recording about this moment that you face as a writer when you have gotten to the end of the story in the writing process, like you've maybe written the whole thing, there's maybe been some rewrites, but it's the first time that you're getting to the, the end point. And you have this thing, and you have the story, but you're thinking, Mm -hmm. it's not done. I'm not, I'm not going to just send this off. So, oh God, it's definitely not done then. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if you could take us back to that moment and, and share a little bit about how you felt when you got to that point and, and yeah. what was going on in your head and everything then. Um, so one thing that I have realized is that everyone has their own definition of what a first draft is. Yes. Um, yeah. I've, I've had friends asked me to read their first drafts and I realized that their version of a first draft was almost like a, like an extensive outline, Mm. you know? And then I have read other first drafts that are like basically finished. (laughs) So yeah, I think there's, I'm, I'm definitely somewhere in the middle. Um, I, so I usually, when I write, I start every day kind of editing what I wrote the day before. Mm. So, so my first draft is generally pretty smooth in terms of like everything's there, the transitions between sections are there, you know, all of that stuff. But I think that I generally, so what, what I did with the Wangs and um, what I will do again with the book that I'm working on now is... At the end, when when I'm sort of like, all right, I'm done. Uh, I think I probably went back through again myself once, just kind of going back through. And um, maybe there were, you know, maybe at that moment there would be a couple of a couple of sections where 
maybe I got tired of making something like an explanation, like really uh, sound right, or maybe there was a particularly kind of sticky area of dialogue that I knew that I needed to go back to, that kind of thing. Uh, I go back, do all of those things, um, make sure that I kind of enjoy reading it. And um, though I don't know what the solution would be if I was like, I hate reading this whole thing. But, <laughs> no. you know, definitely, I definitely remember that first time through there being uh, maybe sections where I was like, oh, this is long, you know, and kind of cutting those, things like that. I thought like that was all sort of first, first draft work. And then... And then I give it to three friends who are all writers. And I mainly want to know, basically, I just want to know if anyone is bored or confused at any point. Yeah, like those are my main areas of concern. And so I just, I give it to three friends. I stop thinking about it for a couple months, you know, and then... um, yeah, and then when when people have read it, and I don't usually uh, have people read stuff in the middle in process. I know everyone also is very different when it comes to that, but for me, I just feel like if someone generally, if I'm going to start writing a novel, I'm already so bought in to the concept and the characters that I don't necessarily need to hear what someone's saying about them in the middle you know right and and if someone reads and they're like but what happens here I would just feel like well it's in the next chapter so you know (laughs) so keep reading Uh, (laughs) yeah um but I had if I hadn't given them you know Uh, yeah exactly it's not written yet exactly so I don't generally have people read in the middle give it to three friends who are writers and then when we discuss I will generally ask first what they loved because I think people feel better telling you what they hated if they've like had a chance to tell you good things first Mm. um but really all I want to know is what they hated right because that's the most useful for me yeah and yeah and then I asked them what where they were confused and where they were bored and then I kind of I having three people read it for me is a good number because I want like if only one person is confused or bored at a particular point then and I don't necessarily feel like it's bad then you know I might not change it but if two or three people do then I'll know like this this needs fixing somehow yeah so that is that's kind of my first draft process so how did you pick these three people other than them being writers were there particular criteria you were looking for for these first round readers yeah I asked friends I asked a wide range of friends you know I have this one friend who I physically write with a lot like we meet up and work together often and that her tastes are fairly similar to mine but not like exactly the same and then I think I asked another friend who has far more more kind of esoteric tastes like generally only reads experimental fiction um, but doesn't even really read fiction that much, like mostly reads dense academic nonfiction. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, and then another friend who, you know, whose reading tastes are definitely more in the kind of thriller, like, like thriller and YA realm. So, yeah, I wanted, like, a real, like, a wide range. And, you know, I'm lucky in that respect. I have a lot of friends who are writers, like, a lot of people to choose from. This is good. Yeah. I, mean, I think also it's it's sort of, like, is someone going to give useful feedback? Are they going to notice things that you want them to notice? I think that's yeah. something that I would, you know, I would look for in somebody I was giving the book to. Definitely, definitely. And they're all friends who are really 
smart and observant. And even if I don't always agree with the things that they love, I find their take on the world to be interesting, you know? Nice. So were you surprised by anything you got back when they when they read it? You know, I the I don't know if you remember, there are chapters where the car is speaking. Yes. And every single writer hated those chapters. (laughs) (laughs) Every single one. But I just I so I guess I I was lying, I guess, when I said that if if a consensus of people didn't like something, I would change it. Um because I just loved them. <laughs> and, and I also I don't I sometimes feel really claustrophobic when a book is really perfect and kind of it like does exactly what you expect it to. And it it was interesting. Every writer was like, uh, readers are not, you know, a couple of people were like, I I get this. I like it. But readers are going to hate this. They're going to rebel. They're not going to like this. And it was honestly the opposite. That's so interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um, So that that surprised me a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that was really surprising. Honestly, not really. I mean... There were, you know, the the book had a lot about, it was explaining a lot of different worlds. You know, there was a lot about the um, kind of crash of 2000. Oh my God, I forgot what year it was. Was it 2008 or 2009? It was sort of right in the middle. 2008, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's when it first hit and then it got real serious into 2009. I feel like the book was like right in the middle. Yeah, late summer of 2008 was when it was. I can't believe I just blanked on that. <laughs> it's been 10 years. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, so there were kind of, um, you know, financial things in there that I knew one of the readers would hate regardless. And when she was sort of like, I liked it, I was actually surprised and relieved. She wasn't like, I love it, you know, but... <laughs> about those sections I'm interested because yours was fairly complicated in the fact that it wasn't just one writer's point of view it moved between uh, one character I should say obviously yeah. one writer it was just you but um it moved back and forth between different characters and did you know going into writing the first draft that it was going to be structured that way because I could equally see moving along and saying you know what I want to break this up and I'm going to change this no I knew I mean when I first started so the the first chapter of the book I wrote so long ago I wrote that first chapter in 2010 Mm. and it pretty much didn't change at all like it got refined that kind of thing but but charles's voice the way that he is enthusiastic about life but also about all the things he hates you know really full of love really full of passion like all of that that definitely it existed it was the first part that existed and then I kind of wrote that rant before I wrote anything else. Like I knew what I been writing about. Like I knew the general world, but I didn't know the outlines of my story yet. And then I wrote that. And then, and then it made me kind of start thinking about his family. And I didn't want to write the whole book in his voice. I feel like that would have been really just too much for, for anybody. <laughs> But, right, it would have been too much for anyone to read. But, yeah, but I think having such a distinct voice for Charles made me think about um, the other characters in terms of their voices. So that was that was sort of there from the very beginning. And I always wanted Barbara, the stepmother, to be a real kind of counterpoint voice she's a lot calmer than the rest of the family she her concerns and interests are really different the way she expresses herself is kind of different um yeah I for me that was honestly one of the most purely enjoyable parts of writing it was was kind of thinking about nailing those those voices 
Yeah, because something I think that's interesting is, uh, this is a weird analogy, but I think about this idea of drafts that sometimes there's an approach of like handling a small number of things and nailing just a few things in each draft. It's like painting your nails, you know, like whether you're the sort of person who does really thin coats oh. to build it up and thinking, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to set that aside. I'm just going to deal with this thing in this draft Yeah. or somebody who's like, nope, I'm doing it perfect from the beginning. I'm going to get, I'm going to pick the color. I'm going to get everything and I'm going to lay it on there and then I'm just going to let it dry. Um, oh yeah. Kind of the latter person in a way. It sounds like, but it. I spend a long time picking the color and picking the <laughs> The width of the brush and the painting conditions, you know. Yeah, you get yeah. the painting conditions down just right. So what was left yeah. for you to think about kind of when you went back through it and before you sent how it out? Responding to each of the characters. I knew how I essentially wanted people to feel about them, but um I, Grace was the character who changed the most the whole way through the process. She's the youngest daughter. And I, th I think initially she's, she's still very ridiculous, but she was a little more ridiculous. And I think that people really didn't feel much empathy for her. Um, she... <laughs> remember that Michael Douglas movie The Game it's it's a oh, very yeah. it had such an impact on me I think because, it a lot actually yeah it was just so horrifying like so strange. it was right for anyone who hasn't seen it it um so it's spoiler alert but honestly I don't believe in spoilers for uh I don't believe that spoilers for a movie that's been out more than 10 years are even a thing but <laughs> we've we've cleared it for you if you yes, want to watch yes. the game you can press pause right now and go yes. watch it and come back yes exactly however yes so watch out uh so in that movie michael douglas is this sort of like very privileged happy guy who kind of has everything and then his life is slowly just ruined like piece by piece um, in every possible way, love, career, everything. Yeah, financial, then, decimated. Yeah, everything. And he's essentially driven to suicide, and he jumps off a building, and you expect him to die, but he's actually caught by a net, and it yeah, turns it's like a out... a huge air pillow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right, I remember it. And it turns out that he's been the either victim or beneficiary of a game set up by his brother, right? Yep. That there's a company who does this thing where they, the goal is to make you appreciate your life. Is that it? Yeah. It, and it's strange because in the beginning, he, the brother says, I'm going to give you this gift. You, sh you need to have yeah. this experience. And he goes and he does this whole intake and they do these huge, like hours and hours of psychological testing, presumably to figure out what he's like. And then mm -hmm. he assumes it's not really happening. But mm -hmm. then it turns out it was. But mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I feel so alive. I, my life was destroyed. And I, you know. He was happy. I remember him being angry at the end. But maybe it was just because I was angry at the end. I think he was happy. I think he came in. He was like, oh, my God. I didn't realize. And they're all like, yay, oh. you did it. <laughs> You did it. You, you threw yourself <laughs> off a building. You threw your life away. <laughs> it is. It's really uh, weird. So how did that influence so the Wangs? Before, so the, one of the things that was edited out was that Grace was convinced initially that this was like the game. That, oh. the, that the loss of fortune wasn't real that the, you know that basically her dad was trying to teach her a lesson about privilege that maybe that she was even like on a reality show and it was funny I thought it was funny but it was but I think everyone was just like she seems extremely delusional and not sympathetic yeah, like she's yeah. in huge denial. I kind of yeah. I think about Grace, actually, given like the increase in the culture of the influencer and her and oh, yeah. all of her fashion blog. I now think of her as like 
an Instagram influencer with all of those little tags mm-hmm. for all of her items that she's wearing. Okay. She could have been supporting the family, man, if, she, you know, if there was Instagram, like, heavy-duty influencer jobs back then. I know. She really could have. It's true. She could have saved everybody. Well, was there anything – I mean – so you go back mm-hmm. through second draft. So, you know, Grace was less sympathetic. So that part got lost, even though you were attached to it. Were there other things you had to give up or I, that you felt I mean, like? It was... Oh, sorry. Go on. Oh, no. I was just, were there other things that you felt like you had to let go of um, because of reader reaction? So we kept the car, which everybody's okay. happy about. <laughs> but we lost delusional Grace. Yes. Um, you know, I think one of the benefits of having been a journalist and also having been an editor is that most things beyond the essential framework, I wasn't especially attached to, you know, if someone had been like, Andrew shouldn't be a stand up comic. I would say that's ridiculous. Of course you're all wrong, you know, but if it was like this whole comedy bit is terrible then I would most likely have you know been easy it would have not been that hard to kind of chuck that and write something else um yeah I didn't I I do think that being a journalist is a really good training in terms of not even killing your darlings but just like not really having that many darlings to begin with yeah I totally agree because I think you get to the point where if somebody is looking at it if you're letting mm-hmm. somebody look at it, then mm-hmm. it's so important to be open to what they have yeah. to say. Yeah, definitely. And I think it would be, I mean, the first time I sent out some of the pages from mm-hmm. my book to my editor, I was, you know, mm-hmm. ill for days. Like, oh, you know, you send out the first bit to somebody and then you think they're going to say, this is a stupid idea. This is not working, you know. Right. But once you get past that initial one, it's like, okay, well, tell yeah. me, tell me what you think. Like, okay, yeah. great. Now you don't think it's garbage. Fine. Then let's, right. let's make it good. And yeah. if I need to cut some crap, I'll cut some crap. No problem. Yeah, totally. Wait, so you're on the final draft of your book or? Well, one never knows. This is another question I had is how many drafts did you have? A Maybe lot. A lot. Yeah. But they didn't necessarily. But wait, I feel like you avoided my question. So you're sort I of. Did. Awesome. <laughs> I, I, well, one can never know if it's the final one until you don't, you're not writing it anymore. I think it's early to say it's the final draft. Okay. I would say it's a middle draft. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Still very exciting. You yeah. have essentially a complete draft. I have a complete draft. It is true. I want to know more about it, but. Well, I, I mean, if, it's. Is this something you've shared on, on the air before or. Not, I mean, not a huge amount. It's more like, I think the process is that at this point. I'm I'm fascinated by people who know how it's going mm. to be structured because one of the things that I experienced was I got to know the characters by writing about them and then realized at the end of, of parts of a draft, they wouldn't necessarily yeah. do things that they had done at the beginning of the draft. Uh, and okay. then that led to some restructuring in order to get to a point where I felt like, okay, this is a cohesive person mm-hmm. that I now know quite well. Mm-hmm. And now I can put them through this whole story and it makes sense. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Because it was like, oh, I thought she was like this, but no, actually, now that I've seen her in all of these situations, I've realized she's actually not like that at all. And right. and I was kind of, I had her starting from the wrong point at the beginning. Interesting. So you really kind of got to know them as you were writing them. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm also just obsessed with this part of it. I think really diving mm-hmm. into the psychology of the character is one of the mm-hmm. parts that I enjoy most because oh, yeah. I study psychology and part. it's, yeah, this is the other thing is like, how do you stop obsessing about figuring these people out and, and just writing the story and, and then moving on with your life? Well, I did so much of that before I even started. So I basically wrote that initial Charles chapter and then I then kind of like started to figure out pieces of the story started to figure out who the characters were and then I asked myself like a million questions about each of the characters so just um you know I 
I chose birth dates for all of them, you know, zodiac signs. Like I knew all of that kind of thing. I, um, especially in the initial stages, if I, I'm also a big outliner and, mm-hmm. and this was a cross country road trip. So in a way it was not the most difficult outline because you have places where they're going. Right. And then I knew, I, and then I sort of matched, uh, what I wanted to say about that particular city or area with the character that I thought would be the most interesting to kind of look at it through. Yeah. So the outline was fairly not easy exactly, but it wasn't, it had fewer decisions to make, I think than you generally do in a novel. But, um, during that whole process, I did a lot also of asking myself just kind of everyday questions about the characters. Like, does Charles like brunch? No, he hates it and thinks it's really dumb. And he also hates portmanteau words, you know, it's just like things like that. But a lot of times when I um, get like when I got stuck and I still do this all the time, if I, you know, sometimes you're writing and you know, you should be working on something, but then you just get bored and, <laughs> yes. um, and you like sit there and stare at the screen. And in those moments, I would always just like ask myself totally random questions, you know, about the characters, like the truly, truly random things, anything like, I don't know. What does Grace think about Coachella? Like just literally. (laughs) Yeah. Just, and the purpose though is to like place them in the world, you know? And I think that helps me, understand how they would respond to situations and and who they were. So how long did you build this relationship with them before you felt like you could start writing a draft that felt quite formed? I would say that my, I I also spend a lot of time um, sort of just making notes about, it's kind of hard to explain. I don't know. I've never really tried to explain it. Like I would say that there is, while I'm outlining, so at least the way that it worked for the Wangs and the way that it actually has kind of been working for this new book is I had the initial kind of spark, wrote that chapter, started just making kind of very sketchy notes, you know, financial crisis time, what's exciting about it, all of that stuff. I read a lot, um, sort of noted like significant moments. I also knew I wanted to write about the art world. I knew I wanted to write about um, art and money and how and how the value of both things are things that we just kind of decide to agree on and, and how that can be expressed through characters and situations. You know, I, I do I start I think I start kind of on two ends, like a character end and a big idea end. And they kind of make their way towards one another. Mm. And so, and the, you know, there were a bunch of other kind of ideas, the myth of the American dream, the, and I also really wanted to write, um, yeah, I really wanted to write a different kind of immigrant novel. And so I really thought a lot about kind of what is it that we expect from immigrant novels and how do we subvert that in a way that's fun and exciting and really readable, but but uh, that still feels like vital to me, you know? Mm-hmm. So for a while, for like months, honestly, I'm just making notes with sort of thoughts on all of these things. And then, and I'm concurrently kind of thinking about these characters and making them feel more like people in my head. And then I sort of go through and... And meanwhile, as I've been making those notes and as I've been getting to know those characters more, I start to think like, oh, okay, this is a thing that Andrew thinks, for example, like this is a thing, you know, they start to feel recognizable. So really they're all my thoughts and opinions, but. Right. But but we, you know, we just decide that these are separate and then we say, yeah, it feels the same way. It's like, oh no, this is how she feels about this. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But. 
I mean, whenever people ask, you know, what character you identify with the most, I always feel like, well, it's all of them because they're actually all me. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You can't really pick and choose on that one. I mean, there may be ones that you don't like as much or whatever, but they're still Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I think you really have to love them all in order to like really write them. Yeah. Even if, yeah, even if they're difficult, especially if they're difficult. Oh yeah, definitely. But, but yeah, so that is a process that for me takes months Mm -hmm. and it's like 70 pages, you know, it's like a lot of stuff. And meanwhile, there are, then I kind of in that process, like naturally start to think of scenes and moments that, that I know that I want to happen. And occasionally some of them, usually it'll be, uh, mostly like internal dialogue, like internal monologue, I guess, mm-hmm. is, is what kind of come up first in my mind. And then, you know, like someone having a strong response to a scene or having like a, or having a strong response to like a moment. Um, yeah. And then those kind of, I kind of place them in the outline of like where they would go. Yes, it's all a very messy kind of building. But I think because of that, I do generally know kind of who the characters are and what I really want to see them doing before I really, really start writing. That makes sense. That actually sounds really (laughs) fun. I'm like, maybe I'll try that next time. It's pretty fun. I know. I That's like it. So fun. Yeah. Like, yeah. The terribleness starts when you're actually like, okay, page one. Oh <laughs> man. Oh man. It's just yeah. There are certain parts. I had certain parts of this where you get to it and you're like, oh, I know this section is necessary to get to the next. Right. There's these uh, critical moments course. that you have to get through, yeah. and you're like, if I don't have this, nothing else is going to make any sense. Yeah. But I just resent writing this part. Yes. Absolutely. Ugh. I don't, I don't know think how we get out of that. I don't know. I think you exactly. just go right through it. Exactly. I think sometimes we know it's more easy, I think, for people to get their minds mm-hmm. around the point. Like when you would move from, okay, I have this idea and now I have mm-hmm. some scenes. And so I know, okay, I feel pretty clear about it. I'm going to start writing. But by mm-hmm. the same token, when you're working on a revision, how do you know I get this question all the time from students and from people like, how do you know when you're done? Well, okay. So I, so I did that. I sent it to the three friends who are writers. And actually, now that I think about it, I forgot a couple of people. I actually sent it to like four or five friends who are writers, got their feedback, went through, did a full revision based on that. And then I sent it, to a few friends who are just readers who love to read. And um, and I also sent it to um, like people who maybe had some experience that I didn't necessarily have that I describe in the book, you know, that kind of thing. So I did, I chose people pretty carefully. Um, And again, I know I'm really lucky that I have a lot of friends who are willing to do this and who are avid readers and writers, you know. Um, So collect these people now, everybody. Yeah, exactly. Collect your reader people. Exactly. It's very useful. I did that. And then and then I kind of did the same thing. You know, they finished reading and then I asked where were you bored and where were you confused? Um, and again, I also asked first, what did you love? And then based on that, I did another revision. And then I went back through one more time and did a, a full sort of like, does every sentence feel smooth to me? Does, you know, are there any factual errors like I I kind of fact checked essentially a lot of stuff and um I'm kind of a stickler about stuff like that I know that there are novelists who couldn't care less if a particular brand of soda was sold in Germany at a particular time that they mention it but 
I care. Like I want to make sure that all of those things are right. So I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So that stuff, like I generally looked up because honestly, when I see that something like that is wrong in a book, I just don't trust the writer anymore. Yeah. You know, it takes feel, you right out of it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So that final draft was like triple checking all of that stuff. Um, but really just like a final smoothing of everything. Yeah. And it felt like it took that, that draft. I generally, I enjoy revising, but that last draft I remember felt like a slow march. Mm. Well, how long did that take? That sounds really, I mean, it's, it That's probably only took like a week, you know, but it took a week of like full time work. And and I think at that point, also, I just wanted to be done so badly. Yeah, I actually still remember I was I was working at um, if anyone knows Los Angeles, there is a hotel in Koreatown called the Line Hotel. It is a fantastic place to write. Which <laughs> part were life. you in? Were you up with the um, plants in the greenhouse part? No, in the lobby. Nice. In the lobby. And I sometimes stayed there even after the lobby turned into like a full on dance party at night because they think you're a hotel guest. So they don't kick you out. <laughs> which is so funny. I also, I write better with like chaos around me. Like, yeah, I'm not someone who wants like a quiet room. That's great. Yes, yeah, so I finished it there. And uh, it was funny. There were these two uh, two girls who were also working there who I didn't know, but they just happened to be there all week, too. And I remember finishing and then looking over to them and being like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was nice to have like a semi familiar face at that point to like celebrate with. That's so great. Um, so but yeah, it was a lot of drafts. It was definitely a lot of drafts. And then, so you've been through your two rounds. You've got your, your mm-hmm. writer round and then your reader round. Mm-hmm. And then you did your big, your big fact checker. And then did you have an agent ready at that point or were you? No, not at all. Yeah. Zero. So yeah, so at that there point, it is I... this, this draft, and you're like, yeah. okay, I'm ready to go. Yeah, come on, world, yeah. publish this. Yeah. At that point, I, you know, I think honestly, the next day, I started to write my query letter, and um, what did I do? I I was very lucky in that I had, though nothing actually truly came of it, but I had a friend who's an editor I she knew that I was working on a book and I sent her the first few chapters and was like hey do you have any agents that you would recommend and so she very kindly put me in touch with um a whole bunch of she sent me a list of maybe 10 people and um so I queried all of them and the, and this was I think this was in early December of 2014 and queried all of them. I got immediate responses back from almost all of them requesting the full manuscript, which felt really amazing. Yeah. Sent the manuscript to them and then heard, Oh, got one like immediate rejection. And then from the rest of them heard nothing for months. Like months and months, I heard not, not, not a word. And then in about like the end of March, I think, of, the, of 2015, I still had not heard anything. And then I was like, I can't take this anymore. And <laughs> I wrote a much more um, intense query letter, like, that was, I essentially was like, all right, um, who knows what's going to happen with any of these people. And instead I decided I was going to aim super high. I mean, these were all really fantastic agents, by the way, also who have like sold amazing books and, and all of that stuff. Um, but, but I was like, I'm just going to send it out to the 
agent like superstars basically and i wrote query letters that were i mean you know they always say like tailor the query letter to the agent but it's generally just a first sentence of i know you represent this book and this book and i love them you know so i wrote much more kind of um slightly I don't know, just like things are like pushed it just a little bit. And um, I changed up the language of the whole letter. I just kind of like loosened it up, made it a little funnier, made it a little crazier. And <laughs> um, sent it out to a bunch of people totally cold, like no connection whatsoever. And didn't hear back from all of them, definitely. Her, but heard back from half of them who all requested manuscripts. And then it was actually really interesting. I got responses from them immediately. Great. Like, Great. yeah. And I do think that it was just being less formal, you know? Also, who knows? I mean, of course, there also could have been some sort of end of the year, beginning of the year thing, all yeah. of that stuff. Yeah, you knows never what know. It is. Yeah. My agent, the person who is still my agent today, Mark Gerald, he happened to read my query letter when he was um, on a plane uh, going to South by Southwest. But it like happened to be the kind of first thing that popped up in his inbox. He would not normally read. I don't think he normally necessarily reads all his own query. You know, it kind of goes through an assistant yeah. first. But it just kind of happened to be there. And he liked the first sentence. So he read it. And... He tech, like emailed me from the plane. It was all, or maybe not from the plane, maybe from his hotel later. But um, yeah, it all just kind of ended up happening really quickly from there. So it was both very quick and extremely long, you know. Much like writing the book. Yes, much like writing the book. Definitely. Yeah, this is the way this process goes. But I think the important thing to take from this is that you know, there may be multiple drafts that mm -hmm. you you don't do these things just once. You know, you have a group of readers and then you have a second group of readers and then mm -hmm. you go through again before mm -hmm. you feel ready to let anyone, you know, who might want to do something with it, see it. It takes a lot of work to make anything good. Yeah. It really does. Like, it's not just, I think that, um, yeah, I think I sometimes see people kind of like, have the initial kind of spark and excitement and write that. And then they feel like, all right, here it is. And yeah, it's general. I mean, maybe occasionally, but honestly, most of the time it is not done then. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. A lot more. Absolutely. Well, this has been so helpful to have a little bit of insight into how you got it from your initial idea, the thoughts you had in the first draft that set you up for the second draft, and then where it went from there. I'm, I'm really grateful that we were able to talk about it more. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure to discuss. And uh, yeah, to everyone who is out there writing a book, just keep doing it. You'll finish someday and it's going to be amazing. Yes, keep going keep going it will get difficult but it will end there is this too shall pass yeah totally thank you so much for listening to the secret library podcast we hope you've enjoyed this week's show you can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.